Welcome back to another edition of the Changemaker Podcast. I'm your host, Deke Copenhaver. My guest today is Michael Schaffer. He's the Executive Vice President, Strategic Partnerships and Economic Developments at Augusta University. Michael joined Augusta University in 2012 as Vice President of Government Relations and Chief Advocacy Officer. Previously, Mr. Schaffer was a Deputy Chief of Staff for Governor Nathan Deal, serving as the top liaison to federal, state, and local officials. He served as Deal's campaign consultant leading up to the 2010 election and previously worked for the late U.S. Representative Charlie Norwood and U.S. Representative Paul Brown. Welcome to the Changemaker Podcast, hosted by Deke Copenhaver. Deke is the author of The Changemaker, a Forbes publishing book that has reached number one on Amazon on multiple occasions and in multiple categories like management skills and total quality management. During this podcast, Deke interviews exceptional change-making leaders. Deke currently operates Copenhaver Consulting, where he helps local governments and other public organizations maximize their potential. He's also a sought-after public speaker. We hope that the change maker has an impact on you today and that you find takeaways that make you a better leader in your life. Now, here's Deke. You just, your accomplishments go on and on, but we'll, we'll just stop it there and get to a few of these things. But Michael, welcome to the show. Glad to have you here. Thank you. Thank you for the offer. Absolutely. Well, you and I, during my time in office, had the opportunity to work together and I've always been impressed with your leadership. You're a big picture thinker, and but I'm, I want for our guest. How did you get? You've been in government for years. How did you initially get involved in politics and government in general? Well, you know, goes back to prior to college. I did it's always interested in the political system. Uh, I was a political science major in college, and as uh, was I. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I loved studying what did government look like. Enjoyed that foreign policy a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's because I stunk at math and you know, some other <laughs> things when I got to that degree. Yeah, but I, we share that in common <laughs> as well. But um, you know, I volunteered on campaigns just like anybody. You find somebody who you're drawn to because of whatever their platform is. Not really ideology at that point. It was just like it was something that was affecting me. Um, and then from there, like a lot of people, they get drawn into it. Mine was a little bit of luck, yeah. you know, it's, uh, who I knew and having a little bit of a background and some campaign work. And when the Congressman Norwood, who was locally a dentist, had yeah. never run for anything in his life, had talked about it, decided he was going to run. I was crazy enough to quit my first job ever, legitimate job out of college and joined him for a hundred dollars a week. Wow. Well, and I I talk a lot about on the show that I think leadership uh, to a large degree is taking a leap of faith. And sometimes it's not always going towards where the big money is. And obviously, if you're getting 100 bucks a week, you are not chasing the dollar on that one. But I want to talk to you a little bit because I'm, I'm fascinated about this. I want to get to your ideas on government. But you were in Washington, you know, for a good while. And just the state of of the government, the federal government at this point in time, it seems like we've never been more politically divided than we are. But I share with people that I think it's, that's not really representative of the nation because I don't know a lot of extremists, but it just seems like in Washington, it's just really difficult to get things done. So what would be the difference between when you were there and now? So, you know, most of my true work period was out of the district being in Georgia. Of course, mm-hmm. I was up there. Uh, but it. when I look at it, and I, this answer may not be, it's probably more technical than anything. Yeah. But I went through five redistrictings in the state mm-hmm. of Georgia, right? Go back to 93. This will be the first one I haven't done. And while what redistricting does, and to your point, is when people are in Washington, they are very divided. Mm-hmm. But when they come home, that's not what their constituency is. Yeah. But many times we have now uh, representatives in Washington that represent districts that are so far leaning one way or the yeah. other. Yeah. They don't. They don't have to vote a certain way. Mm-hmm. Right. You know, when Congressman Morewood, we had a district here in Georgia, it was a 49-51% district. You vote what the people want you to do. Mm -hmm. You represent the people of that district. 
And he would always say, if you came to visit his office, you know, if you're from the district, I'm going to stop what I'm doing. I'm going to meet with you. Mm -hmm. If you're from the state of Georgia, well, I'm going to try to find a way. If you're from another state, I don't have time. Yeah. And he didn't mean that in a rude way. His point was, I'm going to pay attention to my constituents. I think every member of Congress does that. I just think because when they go home, they do that. But when they're there, um, they have the opportunity to be a little more extreme yeah. because they're safe in their seat. So mm-hmm. that's, it's a little bit different way, but that's just from because I've been in the meat of that for so many years. And I, I'd love to get your take on this because you were in it. But it seems like really the extremes are what is reflected in the mainstream media on both sides. And I've often wondered, I'm like, is there more bipartisanship up there than we see in the media? I mean, are there more efforts that that just generally don't get reported? I think that's true. <clears throat> I do think we've lost a little bit of it. You know, you some of the uh, members that have been there for probably too long, for decades, will tell you that they can that have a disagreement on the floor and then go have dinner and drinks at night. Yeah. I think that still occurs. But I do think we've gotten to where media itself is such a 30-minute cycle. You know, it's just over and over, repeat, repeat, repeat. Um, And everything is talked about so much that they just dig into it. I think that's what gets reported as opposed to when you have a caucus that goes off and has agreements. You know, there's Mm -hmm. more than the caucuses that we may be aware of that you hear from. Um, there are groups that meet up there, whether it's 20 of them or 15 or 50 of them that represent something they have in common. We never hear about that. We just hear about the disagreement because that's what sells. You know, every morning I wake up to a shower with Georgia Public Radio. Then I watch a loop of one of the, whether it's Fox and then it's CNN. But I'm at least, because having been in it long enough, just I love to kind of see what everybody is saying. But after an hour, you've heard everything you need to know. Yeah. I, it's, it's amazing to me. And I, you know, I was somewhat in the media for a little while. I had my own talk show. But it, it's just really the, the perspective that they give you is, I think, not really accurate at times. And But... The idea that if it bleeds, it leads, so that's what we're going to report. But I, I think there is a market for, and this is why I do this show. I mean, I bring on leaders from all over the world to have conversations that I think need to be had. And I don't have to agree with my guests completely politically. And, and I've always said I'm never going to hate somebody for having a D or an R in front of their name. But it does seem like the mainstream media, this is the way, but th- but we've always done it this way and we're making money doing it. So let's just keep doing it. Well, I go back to, uh, you know, show my age a little bit, but when Walter Cronkite delivered the news, yeah. they delivered a news. They didn't deliver an opinion. Yeah. Right. They would call that an editorial, but back then they delivered the news. Now we just have talking hits 24 seven. Yeah. And they got to talk about something. And to your point, they've got to talk about something that draws people in to talk about it. I think if there was less, and I'm all about transparency. So when I say I this, well. I don't mean do things in the cloak and, and behind a closed door. But if we didn't just talk about it 24-7, there are, in those individuals that go to Congress, like anybody, there's a bad apple occasionally, but mm-hmm. all of them go there with great intentions. Oh, absolutely. I truly believe that, whether D, R, white, black, West Coast, East Coast. Um, and so I think sometimes they are trying, they are talking so that they can get a point across. And if they do that to the media, then suddenly they get caught up in that cycle. Yeah. To your <clears throat> point, I still think we've got good people. I don't think it's... Um, I don't think it's as bad as the media often portrays it. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's that's interesting to me that we talk about the 24-hour news cycle. And I've shared with my wife, you know, here locally, we've got three local stations. And I think, or four local stations, but I think some of them do two and a half hours. They start at, one starts at four. I'm like, is there enough local news for four stations to cover, I mean, several of them for two and a half hours a day. I'm like, how does it, 
how do you get that much news or are they just focusing on the same thing over and over again? It's over and over again, yeah. right? And to your point, it's the shooting. It's something that is going to draw people's attention. Wouldn't you love the fact if, like when you were mayor, if they would cover more of what was actually going on? Because it helps people better understand when you're trying to reach a solution. Well, it's it's interesting that you say that, but I believed in transparency completely. And I had an open door policy to where reporters could just walk into my office and I'd just ask them, what's the question? But another strategy that we had, Karen Nixon, who you actually was my executive assistant, who you stole away from me to come work for the university. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yes. But <clears throat> I don't know if you remember, she did press releases on everything. I mean, there was not a day that went by. And one time I was sitting at um, home with my wife and I said, oh yeah, um, Karen generated that story. Now, that one was mine. Fred Russell, our administrator, that was... So we managed to sort of drive the news cycle and they and give them things that they really had to report on. And that seemed to really work. And I don't know that a lot of that's going on these days. I don't know if you can still do that. Well, I think that was, you were a different type of leader and one, which is why you're, when you were as mayor, your administration, everybody still, you know, you think about that because people remember the open door. Yeah. I don't, think there's necessarily maybe a closed door now, but I don't think there's as great of an effort to want to go out and push some of the stories, mm -hmm. stories that truly, as you know, as I know, if a company or someone wants to move into this community, they're monitoring, right? Yeah. What, what are, what's being said? What do we say about ourselves? And I think y'all recognize that and y'all pushed out stories. I mean, you weren't trying to make everything appear to be just, you know, through rose colored glasses no. all the time, but you were trying to push out and tell people what was going on. And I, you know, that takes effort yeah. and I'm not sure that everybody puts the effort there. Well, it's interesting in talking about transparency and I get back to leadership. I was speaking at a master's of public administration class at Augusta university recently and a young man who used to be a um, cameraman for our local CBS affiliate, Channel 12, said, when you were in office, so he covered me when I was in office, he said, we could walk into your office any day of the week. And he said, why was transparency so important to you? I said, it was important because w whether you've got something to hide or not, if you're limiting access to the public and the press, it gives the appearance of you're trying to hide something. And so transparency really builds trust. Absolutely. And sooner or later, when you have four stations, as you said, and everybody's reporting, someone is going to, if there is some sort of issue, they will ultimately get to it. So to your point, being transparent on the front end creates trust. Well, one of the things that I discovered, too, is that you know, I've got a great friend, George Diaz, who used to be a reporter for the CBS affiliate. He's gone on to start his own Georgia Strategies group and has done really well. But when he first came to work, you know, I realized that you've got these young reporters, most of them in probably, I know in markets the size of Augusta, but probably others, they're 20 something years old. And from a local government perspective, do they really understand a millage rate increase? So I took the opportunity to really try to educate those young reporters. And, you know, George is one that's gone on to do great things, but we've remained friends for years. And I think that that's a, a probably a pretty good strategy as well. It's amazing when you can have an impact on a young career, yeah. right? They absolutely remember. Well, and that's, you know, you were a young man when you got into the political arena, but you had the opportunity to work with, you know, guys that were statesmen. And I think to, to my mind, and, you know, the list that you have here are great men, but Nathan Deal, our former governor here in Georgia in the United States, <clears throat> just big picture thinker, you know, and, and was a uniter, not a divider. He could divine the will of the people. But talk a little bit about him and how his leadership role, and I have him on a podcast um, with the Georgia Cyber Center. And that's something that, that, that has a worldwide impact right here in Augusta, Georgia. So if you'll allow me, I'm going to back up and Please. tell a story. Yes, tell to, the to come story. come up to that. So 
um, whenever he was first elected as governor, um, you have a, and within a governor's office, mine, I, mine was deputy chief of staff for uh, legislative affairs. So anybody from dog catcher to, to, you know, U S uh, congressman or Senator, anybody fell under me, right? We managed that certainly all the state senators and house members and his legislative agenda and his budget. But then you also had a deputy chief of staff who was policy. And we would meet, and we met around a big table. And what I, we always promised is that we would look at every single piece of legislation. So we're all sitting around the table, uh, probably 18 of us. He's sitting up there. And one of his policy folks, he asked about a piece of legislation, and they gave their thoughts on why they thought how he should uh, either be supportive or not. And he looks at the table and he takes his glasses off and he looks, he goes, okay. He goes, I, that's good. He goes, he says, let's talk about it for a minute. And so for the next 20 minutes, there's a dialogue. And suddenly you realize he's led you to where his point was. And because, you know, his career and, and legislation back to when he was a state Senator, right. Mm -hmm. And years before, um, he led the team to understand his point of view without saying, I disagree with you. Mm -hmm. He never would say that, right? It was how he said, well, let's think about this. And then he would educate and, and, and speak with you. And finally, you're all like, I get it. Yeah. I say that, I say that, I tell that story a lot when people ask me about Nathan Deal because that's the kind of a leader he was. Mm -hmm. Again, he would never say, um, I disagree with you. You know, I sat in on many a meeting, and I think anybody, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, who you are, that had a meeting with him would say, even if he told you, if you were, to, if it, the answer was no, you left feeling pretty good about it. Yeah. Right. Um, but the chance for him to to make the Georgia Cyber Center reality was, you know, Nathan Deal again, is willing to look at what's best for the state of Georgia. Mm -hmm. And I remind people that the state, I guess this year, we're now the eighth year in a row, number one state to do business. Um, and very big on uh, making sure how do we grow the state's workforce. And when it came time to Augusta and understanding that here was this entity being Army Cyber was going to invest a lot of money in Georgia, $2.3 billion was the number then. Um, and the fact that typically the state spends a lot of incentives to draw mm -hmm. in companies, whether they're tax credits or job credits or, you know, giving away, this was a chance to say, okay, they didn't ask for anything, but what they're asking for now, if you think back, was we need training, we need innovation. Mm -hmm. And he was like, well, how do we do that? What does it take to do that? So he, a lot of people <clears throat> turned to him when it was announced and said, well, this should be built in Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And the governor was, it wasn't a matter of, well, no to Atlanta. It was bound, it makes sense. This is why Augusta. And ultimately, um, I think it's a location, location, location. Mm -hmm. Well, it, it's interesting to me though. I so at the Georgia or at the Cyber Future Foundation Summit at the Georgia Cyber Center recently, I had the opportunity to interview Governor Deal as part of one of the programs. But what amazed me is I so that was a worldwide audience. I mean, there were people from all over the world in the room, and some logged in online. But so, and we get back to messaging. I thought, how many people? in Augusta proper, understand that, you know, we're potentially becoming the cybersecurity capital of the world, due in no small part to that investment in the Georgia Cyber Center, but that people from all over the world are coming here and they're meeting with you and they're learning from what's being done at the Georgia Cyber Center around cybersecurity, which blows me away because that's a growth industry forever. You know, when the state, when a state spends the amount of money that Georgia spent to build the Georgia Cyber Center, about one hundred six million dollars, you know everybody wants to say, in in the economic development world, as you know, is well, how many jobs did you create? Well, 
you know, my involvement, I was up front very clear is that this isn't about the number of jobs that we're going to create in these buildings, right? But still, you know, at some point you have to answer that question. Well, if we've been studying this and looking for a year, and it's not like if you would, you know, if you pull in Caterpillar or Baxter Corporation or Kia or any of those, you know, because they tell you up front, we're going to create 500 jobs mm-hmm. in the first year. Or we're going to create 1,000 jobs. This was an infrastructure investment is the way I would look at it, much like the Port of Savannah. Mm-hmm. We're going to deepen it. Again, on Governor Deal's watch, they, we – because the feds weren't coming up with the money, the state put the money up first to get the job done and then get paid later. So with the Georgia Cyber Center, what we've built is a place that you can do training, where you can do innovation, where you can do something other states have talked about but have not done it. You put Mm -hmm. academia, government, industry all in one building, right? Not just all spread out on a campus somewhere. And what you're seeing is, yes, there's jobs there, but what you're seeing is to what you just alluded to, it's a draw for so mm-hmm. many, whether they open up around the new gate, whether they're in South Richmond, whether they're downtown on Broad Street, or maybe they're actually even across the river, right? Right mm-hmm. over into South Carolina. It's still regional. We've had 42 states come and visit and say, how and, you know, why and how? How did yeah. you do it? Um and you, look, you have to look back to the governor and say, well, number one, the state of Georgia has to have a balanced budget, and we had a rainy day fund of over $2.7 billion. Not every state has access to that. Yeah. So there's number one. And number two, to be willing to invest some of those dollars. Um, again, it's an economic development project, uh, and I look at it as infrastructure. Yeah. So I love to tell people, I said, if you think about the state of Georgia, it's kind of like some crown jewels. Everybody thinks about the Port of Savannah, which it is. Um, The airport in Atlanta, Hartsfield, right? It's a window from the, you know, it's the doorstep of the world flying into Georgia. And then Augusta, Georgia with the Georgia Cyber Center. I just look at it as another part of the crown jewel. Well, one of the things that I discussed with Governor Deal is I think another aspect of good leadership is humility. And I know that he didn't want, I mean, he didn't do that project because he wanted his name on the campus. But I would say the same thing about you. You have not really, and I know you never would, but you were key in making that project happen. And it's it's a team effort, but I just want to thank you for the role you played in doing that. Well, thank you. Yeah, you know, uh, much like you and I were talking about prior to starting to record, uh, uh, talking about Karen Nixon, Mm -hmm. you know, she just, she did it for the love of the job. You know, my part in it was, I was just, you know, relationships after 27 years and being in the right place to be able to try to connect some things going on, um, it's a, it's a job you love. Um, thankful for Governor Deal because he uh, is the one that made it happen. And just, you know, getting to be a part of his administration uh, helped me understand what a great person he was and the ability, if there's something you think that can be beneficial and bringing it to his attention. Uh, so just for me, a little bit of just right place at the right time. But it really was a love of the community we get to call home. Well, and I I think good leaders like Governor Deal are good communicators and they're good collaborators and they build strong cultures. And I was referencing that when I was interviewing him, the culture at the Georgia Cyber Center, it's people want to go there to work. And I look at sort of the change in you, my friend, because I remember when you used to wear a coat and tie every day, as did I. (laughs) And now my friend Michael, who works at the Cyber Center, Where's Chuck Taylor's to this interview? And we both have on these plaid shirts, but we've both gotten a little more casual. But talk about the the culture of that work environment. It's just, it's cool to see. There's it's such a great energy at the facility. It really is. It, people ask the secret sauce, and you know, there you can point to many things, but I would say it really is the people. And, and you know, everything to, you know, having been in government for 27, 29 years, 
and walking through halls that the the doorways say room B1-111 or whatever, right? One of just the little things is every room is named, right? Mm -hmm. To not look like a government academic building. You know, we call it the plug and play. If you request to use what most people would call an auditorium, you get a document that says, well, you would like to use the plug and play, right? Or the <laughs> virtual world. Uh, the virtual world is three rooms that can be combined or they're separately is the bit, nibble, and bite. Yep. Now, as little as that is, if you're a student in that building or you're a worker in that building, that's what you see every day. You don't see room A dash da 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 da. That makes you look like you're in a government building. Between that, between the artwork, between uh, the music that's played, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> Um, it's just, it's the little things that add up that make people not so that they don't realize they're in a, in a government or an academic or a building that's like that. You know, you can get on a elevator and there'll be a student in shorts, flip flops and a backpack. There'll be somebody in blue jeans with a gun on their hip, which could be a GBI agent, Right which is in the building, GBI being Georgia Bureau of Investigation, mm -hmm. our mm -hmm. state police force, or you'll have someone in their military fatigues. Very seldom do you see a suit, but you may. Then we all look at them <laughs> and yeah. wonder who they are. But you just, there's such a mixture, and that's common. That's yeah. every day of them crossing paths. And that creates um, a sense of something a little different that they've never been to before. And I, I think one of the problems, and I'll get back to it, is if is silos. I mean, in any community, and I, I tell people, I'm like, how do you expect to grow as a person if you only talk to people that look like you and think like you that were raised in your environment? But I think that blending of different ideas and of different individuals, you know, collaboration creates innovation and that's what you guys are doing by having that mix there at the Georgia cyber center. Silos is so real. Yeah. And even organizations there could get into silos mm -hmm. themselves once they get into their own suites or into their own office space. But we do our best to force the issue. And, you know, I got called a lot of bad names and emails when talking to some of the companies that were there, not their people local, but, you know, we didn't let people build uh, their own um, breakout space in their, you know, a kitchenette in their mm -hmm. space. We've provided that in the core of the building in the center so that people had to come out to go get coffee or to, or use microwaves or refrigerators, and it was the forcing people to come together. You know, a lot of attorneys that were, you know, doing the closing documents to do space were like, what is this? You know, what do you mean by this? You know, once we described it and held to it, they'd done that. We're creating a, a floor now um, that will be there for innovation, the, the suite size was anywhere from 2,500 to 4,000 square feet, nine opportunities, but we are literally building out the collaborative space for that floor. Mm -hmm. It's an incredible space. It is done so that it is wide open. And if you're on that floor and you're going around to get somewhere, you have to walk through it. So we're making you have to interact with it. So very deliberately, we do that before you even get to programming ways of getting people together. You know, it's, it's interesting. I, back when I had a radio show, somebody asked me, well, if you could, if Augusta was a food, what would it be? And I said, it would be gumbo. Because for our listeners that are outside the area or potentially outside the U.S., gumbo is just a mix of everything. And it's originated in sort of Louisiana but I said, because you know that gumbo would never taste as good if it only had one ingredient. And so I think that's, but that's, that's interesting to me. And I love to, as I say, I love to come to the cyber center because I could meet some long haired kid in Birkenstocks or I could meet a general or I could meet a GBI agent. That's variety really is the spice of life. It's, um, 
it, and you really have to be purposeful in the beginning. Yep. Now, you can grow into it, right? You can get a culture that grows. But even then, you have to, to focus on it. As we were coming up in the beginning, and remember, we opened July of 2018. Mm-hmm. Um, we programmed one full-time employee, one FTE, and the, the title for that position was someone that was going to focus on the ecosystem. Yeah. <clears throat> always being the person that whomever our partners were that were located there, that they were the one that were going to constantly be in contact with them Mm -hmm. to let them know, here's what's going on. Here's the opportunities, just a common voice and face that they would see and, and and they, they could turn to if they had a question as crazy as it sounds, you know, we've put up Christmas trees for everybody, Right. And we're going to do a contest, right? And we've done it the, the two years prior to this. And we just have fun with it. You know, GBI did a crime scene. You know, on the ground was the outline of a, you know, of a person. <laughs> and they were hacked up the um, devices because they're, they're the ones where a lot of evidence comes, you know, as some of the uh, elect- uh, electronics mm-hmm. that are uh, sent in. Uh, handcuffs so it you know it's just fun and, yeah. and we we do that and then we we have a little bit of a competition you know but but you hit the nail on the head with something and i think this gets back to leadership that building that type of ecosystem or culture or whatever you want to call it it takes being purposeful so i recently had a keynote speaking engagement with wild wings cafe you know a chain of wing restaurants um And I I described what good culture looks like, and I described that's effectively what we were able to do when I was in office with local government. And a big part of that was Karen Nixon, but myself and our then administrator, Fred Russell, we we treated the department heads with dignity and respect and had their back even if the elected body didn't. So they would stick their necks out for us. They would go out of their way to provide excellent customer service. But that, that was very purposeful, but one of my comments to wild wings and i've used chick-fil-a as an example the the, that culture is amazing and it's successful and i have shared with people i'm sure somebody said when Truett kathy the um the gentleman who started chick-fil-a said well i'm not going to open on sundays they're probably like you're a moron because you're going to lose so much money but i think they've gone on to do pretty well (laughs) but it goes to your point i said at the end of my speech to wild wings if you don't have somebody riding herd over that culture, that ecosystem on a daily basis, it can go away really quickly. It really can. You, it, you've got to have somebody that is paying attention to it. We try to pay attention to the details. Yep. And um, we try to do the little things uh, that are going to make a difference for somebody. You know, another piece of this is we put a full-time person to work with our students. And, you mm-hmm. know, we have students from both our – the Georgia has a technical college system and a university system, you know, your two-year and your four-year. And they both have advisors they can turn to, right? But we have a full-time person that is there to work with them and give the white-glove treatment – and, and say, we try to connect them with some of our, we call them resident partners, but they're the industry. They're the mm-hmm. ones who are going to do the hiring. They're there doing work. How do you make that connectivity? You know, it's part of the ecosystem. You go from being a student to being an intern to being employed. Well, that's a benefit to everybody involved. That's the student. It's to the university or to Augusta Tech and to the employers. They love that. And Again, it's, it's kind of a circle there, but, you know, our ecosystem, we try to do it for everyone, whether you are a student there or whether you're one of our industry partners. Well, while I was still in office, um, then Augusta National Chairman Billy Payne announced that he was going to develop the Masters Golf Tournament into the world's preeminent sporting event, not golfing event, but sporting event. And at that point in time, I'm like, well, you know, then we should become the preeminent mid-sized city in the world. And so I, that sort of set the bar for me. And I, everything we pursued when I was in office, we tried to focus on excellence. And I, I made mention at the cyber conference the other day, 
that the Georgia Cyber Center it is exactly that. It is, I mean, it is a world class facility doing things that are going to benefit not just the United States of America, but benefit the rest of the world. So I'm so proud of the work you guys are doing there. And it's another thing that Governor Deal and I touched on is, once again, back to humility. It's amazing what can happen when nobody cares who gets the credit. You know, he was, for me, just a great, you know, someone to learn from, yep. someone to look up to for his leadership. You know, when he first came in, many on the team wanted him to get involved in the uh, Governor's Association. And they wanted him, the Governor's Association, the National Governor's Association, and the Republican Governor's Association to be a leader because he really had great thoughts on justice reform. Mm -hmm. But he said, when I'm done here, I'm done. I've done, you know, I've done my public service. I'm ready to go to the mountains. I'm ready to go, you know, to yeah. my cabin, and I'm done with public service. And, you know, that frustrated a few of the, the team because they wanted him and said, you're a great person. We yeah. want you to do this. But his total focus was on Georgia. Yep. And knowing I'm not running again for something, and his total focus was how do I make Georgia, you know, a better place? How do I continue to pass on and – uh, just a great leader, and I was just grateful to have an opportunity. Well, you know, he reminds me of, uh, so one of the greatest leaders in history was George Washington, and they effectively offered him the opportunity to be king of the United States, and he said, no, I'm going back, you know, to my farm, and walked away, but I think that to be able to walk away and turn down that power, if you want to have it, is really the mark of a great leader. And I, Governor Deal is, and I, I'm so happy for him because he did do his time in public service. But that I would get the question often, you know, aren't you going to run for higher office? And I said, I, I didn't do it seeking, I didn't run for mayor seeking higher office. I did it for Augusta. I had nine years of doing it, and there comes a time when you need to walk away. And I had a conversation with Tom Patterson, our mutual friend from yeah. Unisys. He said, you know, Going back is rarely a good idea, <laughs> but it's so you see, you see athletes that stay on too long and you see politicians, you know, pe people in leadership that may stay on beyond their shelf life. I think it's always good if you can walk away at the pinnacle and with governor deal last year, opening up the first part of the Georgia cyber center, he, he walked out at the pinnacle and that's always a wonderful thing to see. It, it, he, uh, he got to do it uh, on his terms, his way. Yep. Um, you know, he's still giving back to George. He's still doing, you know, some, a little bit of teaching or lecturing. Uh, but, um, you know, I talked to him about, I guess it was last Christmas, went up there with a couple of other former members of the staff and just went to lunch, his favorite Mexican, just, <laughs> just basic Mexican, uh, right? Well, I share that with him. Yeah. I did not know that. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was asking him what he had done recently that he enjoyed. And he said, well, you know, I just did a sit down and I can't remember who it was, but they had done an interview with he and Roy Barnes. Mm -hmm. And for those who are listening, don't realize Roy Barnes was the last Democratic governor. Mm -hmm. um, in Georgia. And then of course you had Sonny Perdue and the Nathan deal. And much like we started off here talking about the division or the, or is it really that division? And R Roy Barnes and Nathan deal sat there and talked and had fun and talked about what they each did and enjoyed about their job and, and how they view Georgia. And if you could, you know, disguise their voices, you probably wouldn't tell the difference of why they did it and what they, yep. why they did it for the state of Georgia. Well, and that's, that's, I want to see more of that. And I, and know both of those gentlemen, but that's, a, that's a great conversation to have. And it's like two old warriors yes. getting together to talk about the battles that they fought. But well, Michael, we're getting towards the end now, but I want to ask you a question that I try to ask all my guests. What on a daily basis puts a smile on your face and puts joy in your heart? Uh, truly um, success of someone that is a member of a team yeah. or that I'm around. Um, I had the advantage of uh, 
two nights ago, um, University System of Georgia, all their legislative affairs folks came from across the 26 colleges. And amongst that team were six people that worked as under my uh, leadership at the state capitol in the governor's office. And I had the best time seeing those six growing into new roles and as they have continued their career. Yep. Um, and so I still get to do that today, right? I still I always have someone that is kind of that up and coming. And to be able to sit there and give them plenty of opportunity to lead on their own without me sitting there telling them how to do a job and reminding them it's okay to fail. Yeah. I'm, I'm good with failure. Let's just, I'm, there's, you're not failing completely because you're going to learn from it. Yep. And so, honestly, I get that opportunity every day with at the Georgia Cyber Center of working with someone like that. Well, that's like, you know, with Karen Nixon having worked in my office before working with you, it's fun to watch what she's continued to go on and do. And then Al Dallas, who was my second um, executive assistant, is now chief of staff at the Georgia Cancer Center. And so I, I say that I was two for two in placing my executive directors into the university system. But it's just fun to watch people succeed. It is. It's great. Well, man, I sure do appreciate you being here today. This has been a great opportunity to have a good conversation that hopefully our guests, get, our listeners get some takeaways from. Great. Well, thank you for having me today. Absolutely. Dropping the mic and we are out.